Good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to have you here this afternoon. I want to apologize again for the space in this room. We did the best we possibly could. And uh, we had our uh, various chairs from the caucus help us get a room. And this is the best we could do. And I regret it, uh, I regret it very much. But we'll do better by you next time. You all know by now that uh, in this uh, 15th or 16th year of doing the caucus, we always welcome your ideas <clears throat> as to what we should put on as topics. And we've done many things already this year, gene therapy, HIV, uh, cancer, and today we're gonna do avian flu. And we welcome any, any, any suggestions from your office, of course. And this year we have our chairs, uh, Sherry Bullitt, Lois Capps, Rush Holt, and, and Mike Castle, and we're delighted those folks are the same ones that fought so hard several years ago to double the funding for the NIH. And that was a monetary uh, just a few years ago. And of course, I don't need to you how difficult it is today, how hard it is today to uh, get funding. Uh, the House is, uh, looks like it's going to hold the NIH flat. On the Senate side, Senator Specter, along with uh, Tom Harkin, Senator Snow, Tom DeWine, uh, Lincoln Chafee, and Senator Collins are trying to put in extra money for the NIH. So what we want to tell you, without proselyting you today about funding, is that down the road, in the fall, the Labor HHS bill will come up between the House and the Senate. We want you to keep in mind the NIH. That will be the grand moment when you can strike a blow for the NIH and for funding. It's so necessary in science, as you well know. Today we're going to learn about the risk of a pandemic influenza, caused by the transfer of influenza A viruses or virus gene segments from aquatic birds, muscovy and mallet ducks, I'm told by the scientists here, to domestic animals and humans. We'll review the options for controlling the virus because avian viruses do not commonly infect humans. There's little or no human immune protection against them. There's also no commercially available vaccine to protect humans against the H5N1 virus. And we're privileged today to have with us a truly renowned world scientist in the field of viral immunology and the influenza viruses. Dr. Robert Webster is a professor in the Division of Virology, Department of Infectious Disease at St. Jude's Children's Hos Hos Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. He's a native of New Zealand, down under. Dr. Webster received his Bachelor of Science and his Master of Science in Microbiology from Otago University in New Zealand. In 1962, he earned his doctorate from the Australian National University and spent the next two years as a Fulbright Scholar working on influenza in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Since 1975, just imagine this now, for the last 30 years, Dr. Webster has been director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for studies on the ecology of influenza in animals and birds, one of only five such collaborating centers in the world. His interest includes the emergence and control of influenza viruses, viral immunology, the structure and function of influenza virus proteins, and the development of new vaccines and antivirals. Dr. Webster. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for coming. It's my honor to be invited to present here, and I bring you uh, greetings from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and I'd like to begin by telling you what I'm going to explain to you about influenza over the next 20 minutes or so was made possible for, by funding by NIH. Without it, these vaccines and antivirals that you know about and are going to hear about would not have been possible. I'm going to begin by giving you the uh, 101 virology course on influenza. Influenza is, is an RNA virus. Could we have the light down a little bit if it's possible? I don't know. Don't all go to sleep. <laughs> so it's... Uh, Influenza, as I say, is an RNA virus, and it's one of the most variable viruses in the world. The other variable virus that you've heard about are HIV, 
but uh, influenza accumulates changes in its spiked glycoproteins. It's shaped a bit like a hedgehog, and it keeps changing the spike. don't neutralize it and it can attach these purple spikes to your respiratory tract and cause this year's flu and no two flu viruses are the same every one is different from each other it's constantly putting in point mutations in all its proteins particularly these purple spikes that combine with antibody uh, and neutralize it so there's a war going on, a constant war between your body and this virus. The virus is varying and the body is trying to keep up. And so in addition to that, the virus has a segmented genome. It's really like a little animal with eight RNA segments so that if you get two of these viruses into a single cell, they can have virus sex if you like. They, 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 these two viruses can put off 256 different children. And, and so this is an enormously powerful virus. And the body has, and the virus has no control on this. It just keeps varying. You all think influenza is a problem for humans. The reality is that all of the influenza viruses, there are 16 families of them. They all live in the aquatic birds, simply the wild ducks, geese, and swans of the world, where they've li lived for millions and millions of years. And the, uh, it's uh, only occasionally that they move over to humans, and so far, this century, the past century, we've seen three of these 16 in humans. Two show up in pigs, another two in horses, and there are three of these families that are trying it on, if you like, with humans. They move occasionally from the reservoir in wild birds to humans, the H5 family, the H7, and the H9 family. We're going to spend most of the time upon the H5 family. The World Health Organization has a network of labs all over the world to watch this, these changes in flu. There's about uh, 120 laboratories scattered throughout the world. And the World Health Organization, together with FAO, F F the Food and Agricultural Authority, and the OIE that look after animal health, they are all beginning to work together. They used to, the, the message was that WHO took care of humans, FAO took care of animals. Now these organizations are actually getting their acts together and starting to talk to each other because they realize that flu is a zoonotic disease that involves them all. I was in Rome last week and it's good to see these various organizations actually working together. The humans, in humans, this, the, the, the annual epidemics occur because this virus keeps varying, avoiding the immune response. These 120 labs around the world keep isolating influenza viruses from humans. The aim is find next year's vaccine strain, get it in the vaccine in time to protect all of you people who will take the vaccine. How many in this room took vaccine last year? I'm somewhat impressed, but rather disappointed that many of you didn't take it. <laughs> I've got some news for you. I just want you to concentrate on what I'm saying later about what the current vaccine will do for bird flu. You see, we met in Geneva February last and decided that these are the viruses that are going to be in this next year's standard vaccine. And my advice to every one of them, of you, get that vaccine. And in addition, there are two or three pandemics a year uh, in the past century. And I'm going to spend a bit of time on those. <clears throat> I've already indicated that flu comes from the aquatic birds of the world where they live harmoniously together, no problem. 
until they transfer into other species like the pig, poultry and humans and then they go crazy. They evolve at an enormous rate. The other important point that I want to draw your attention to is that there is a geographical separation into two superfamilies in the world. There's one superfamily in Eurasia, in Asia and Europe, and another superfamily in the Americas. And this is because the ducks that carry, or the wild birds that carry these viruses, really migrate north and south, but they do overlap in places like Alaska. But the very fact that there are two superfamilies means that this swapping doesn't occur all that often. Consequence of that is I don't think bird flu is going to come into the Americas via the Alaskan overlap, more likely to be smuggled in by a, someone bringing in a pet bird in their back pocket, much more dangerous than the wild birds. Turning to the pandemics of last century and what they did to humans. The granddaddy of all pandemics in humans was the 1918 Spanish. Of course, Spanish flu didn't occur in Spain. It uh, was introduced, Americans used biological warfare for the first time in 1918. They didn't know they were doing it. The American troops that were taken in 1918 to fight in the First World War carried the 1918 virus from Kansas through the troops into Germany or into France, the wind blew it across to the Germans and that's what finished World War I. It wasn't the tanks, it was this influenza virus and neither the Allies nor the Germans wanted it acknowledged that it was an influenza giving trouble so they blamed it on the Spanish, Spanish flu. And so we now know this virus has been we know a great deal about it thanks to Jeffrey Dalbert Taubenberger. This virus got all its eight gene segments from a wild bird, the whole virus. And it was an enormous killer. It shut down whole cities in the United States and throughout the world. It's the one that we fear most. The other two pandemics of the pa past century, the Asian and the Hong Kong, they emerged by a different strategy. They reassorted their genomes, if you like. They had this virus sex, where the virus picked up three of its gene segments, its spike glycoproteins, from Asian waterfowl, five gene segments from the human virus, and the transmissibility factor probably came from the last human strain. And so we generated this virus. We don't know whether it occurred in pigs. It may have. The Hong Kong most probably did occur in pigs. And so that's why we are rather concerned about pigs. And you'll hear more about that. Let's turn now to this H5N1 bird flu. And we first met this virus in 1996 in Hong Kong. A few geese in Guangdong died. No one gave much attention at all to that fact. Then this virus got into the poultry markets in Hong Kong and it reassorted with the viruses in those live poultry markets. These are mixing places for viruses with the ducks, the chickens, the whatever, all together. And th this virus emerged, spread to humans, 18 humans in Hong Kong were infected and six of them died. This is the first time we've known one of these viruses to transmit to humans and kill them. All of the poultry in Hong Kong were destroyed. The ducks, the geese and everything was destroyed. And I was involved in that and people would ask me, you know, what did you do with the millions of chickens and ducks that you destroyed in a couple of days? And I explained that, you know, at that time they were building the new Hong Kong airport runways. A whole island was being flattened. And I t tell them, the next time you land in Hong Kong and you have that feather soft landing, <laughs> you're going to know where, that, where those birds were buried. Anyway, 
Killing all those birds didn't get rid of the virus. The virus kept coming back from southern China, out of the geese. 2002 to 3, it spread right across southern Asia, or Southeast Asia. And that was the first major spread. The second major spread was in May of last year when it spread in, from China across to Europe. And we'll come to that in a moment. The current status is there's been 225 human cases and over half have died. Let's hope that this virus does not acquire the ability to transmit human to human. We'll have big trouble. I want to spend a moment on the surveillance that we've been doing across southern China in conjunction with the University of Hong Kong. This program is supported by NIH. In 1997, when Hong Kong went back to China, I put in a grant to NIH to support the studies in Hong Kong. There was one person left in Hong Kong because they were afraid that everything would shut down. Thanks to NIH, there is now a major center in Hong Kong. And without that center, much of the information wouldn't be available today. So this is some of the work that they've been doing. We survey five provinces across the south of China. Chinese don't like it all that much, but we do it in conjunction with some of the Chinese uh, in universities. And we find that in ducks, in geese, we isolate H5N1 every month of the year from apparently healthy geese in the markets. A lot from the ducks in the markets, but the chickens in the markets only in the winter <coughs> months. That's when the most of the transmission occurs in the winter months to the chickens and to humans. Keep it in mind that these viruses are there in the geese and the ducks across southern China all the time. They're using vaccines to try to control this. And maybe we could come back to that at the end if someone has a question. So I've indicated that this virus spread from Qinghai Lake in central China, rapidly across to Europe, India, now Africa. This is not quite up to date. There are many more countries in Africa affected. And uh, so how did this virus spread rapidly, so rapidly westward? The uh, bird people of the world, the ornithologists, were, are really upset with me uh, because I blame the wild birds for moving it. And they say that, you know, the birds don't migrate westward, you know, Webster. They don't do that. And, and that it was probably the poultry industry and they went across on the Siberian railway. Sorry, folks, the migratory birds did play a role together with the globalized poultry industry. The key factor was a very, very cold winter in Russia and the uh, Baltic Sea froze. Swans that normally live beside the Baltic Sea moved across the whole of Europe. And, and so, sorry folks, the weather messed up the migratory pathways. They did move west. In Europe, recently, f last week from Rome, there's been 700 outbreaks of H5N1 and wild birds. Fortunately, so far, only four of those outbreaks have moved to commercial poultry. And in Europe itself, none to humans. So that, keep it in mind that this can be done. Africa, there's probably good news in Africa. The bad news is that the virus is there. And it was introduced into Nigeria, probably in commercial chickens from China, and it also came across in the migratory birds. The good news, as I alluded to, is it doesn't seem to have got into the wild bird population because the migratory birds going back from Africa to Europe this spring have no one has detected H5N1. That's good news. And maybe Africa's too hot and dry. And maybe in Africa, 
what's there will burn out. So how pathogenic is this virus? What, what do we know about the pathogenesis of it? This is one of the representative strains from Vietnam from 2004. It kills chickens in less than a day. If we inoc inoculate chickens this afternoon, tomorrow they're dead. Every chicken is dead. Put it into ducks, that kills the ducks in one to two days. In humans, there's some unique features. We get diarrhea with this virus. Normally, many people say, I had diarrhea, uh, tummy flu. There's no such thing as tummy flu with standard influenza. There is with the 1918, or there was with 1918, and there is with this one. We put these viruses into ferrets, the little animal that is the model system for studying flu. And again, we have respiratory signs, gain diarrhea, hind leg paralysis, the virus goes to the brain, and the ferret dies. I've worked with influenza for 30 something years. This is the worst influenza virus I've ever seen. And we hope to God that it doesn't learn transmissibility. What about pigs? I've already indicated that pigs are important in some of the possibilities of transmission. The H5N1 was isolated from pigs in China, Vietnam, we isolated in Vietnam in conjunction with the Vietnamese, and in Indonesia. And so the virus can go from time to time in pigs. We don't believe the virus is established in pigs in these countries. So at St. Jude, in our high-level containment laboratories, we inoculated pigs with a human strain, a chicken strain, a duck and a goose strain. Put the virus into one pig and put another pig in the same isolator. And these pigs rub noses, get the, virus, the, the food out of the same spigot. And the infected pig, uh, virus replicated in the lungs, spread outside to the local lymph nodes. The pigs didn't die, but considerable virus in the nose, but the virus did not spread from this nose to this nose even though they were smooching on each other. So this virus lacks transmissibility. What is transmissibility? We don't know. Scientists, we do not know yet what is the molecular base of transmissibility. On the other hand, this virus can transmit in some animals. Sick chickens were fed to tigers in Thailand and leopards. They both died and the virus transmitted tiger to tiger. In the Netherlands, well in Thailand and in the Netherlands, they've fed infected chickens to domestic cats. The domestic cats died and the virus transmitted cat to cat. In the field in Germany, cats have died from eating dead infected birds. Many in this room will have pet cats. They will be a problem. What to do with them if this virus gets into the States? So where are we? What are we doing in control measures? And I first want to share some very new information with you and the reason why you should all take the current vaccine next year. My colleague Richard Webby uh, at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital has vaccinated mice with the current vaccine that contains the New Caledonia 99 strain, that contains the N1 neuraminidase. And then he boosted these mice with the N1 neuraminidase. Then three weeks later, he hit them with this red hot Vietnam virus that kills everything. Only half of the mice died. So the message is the current vaccine, the current vaccine that is available will give you some basic immunity through the N1 component. So take it. The other information that he provided was that when, when he screens 14 serum at random from this room, take 14 serum, and are there any antibodies that react with the Hong Kong 
virus or the Vietnam virus? The yes, there is. Two people out of 14 had antibodies, the neuraminidase antibodies, to both the Hong Kong and Vietnam strain. So it's for real folks. The advantage of taking the current vaccine. Then turning to the vaccine preparation to the bird flu. Until uh, to the year 2000, it was not even possible to make a vaccine to bird flu because this virus kills chickens, it kills eggs, and it kills people. So you can't make a vaccine. The vaccines are all made in chicken embryos. The chicken embryos are killed. And so thanks to basic research by Eric Hoffman, supported by NIH, established the fundamental principles of how to make a vaccine for this virus. And it's called reverse genetics. The principle is really very simple. You take each of the RNA segments from this, the influenza virus, put them into bacterial plasmids. Sounds simple. Technically, it's damn difficult. And so the, from the Vietnam H5N1, we want the spike glycoproteins put onto our vaccine strain. So we take each of those genes, we clip out a piece that we know that's responsible for making it a killer strain, throw it away, and zip up the gene for the hemagglutinin spike. Then we take the neuraminidase spike that I've just been talking about, and six internal genes from an old-fashioned virus from 1934, put them into Vero cells, and the, we can make whichever influenza virus we like. And so we can generate the vaccine strain. This was done at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and the vaccine tested in the ferret model. We tested it with a Hong Kong virus from 2004. It completely protected the, the, the your ferrets, no disease at all. Then we challenged with this really nasty Vietnam 2004. The virus was shed in those ferrets. They lost some weight, but the virus didn't go to the brain and there was no disease signs. And so I'm arguing many people are saying, well, we, it's no use putting away vaccine stockpiles because the virus will vary. I disagree. It is important to put away stockpiles because this vaccine would probably not prevent you from getting infected, not prevent you from getting sick, but would protect you from death if we use the information from the ferret model and the mouse model. These vaccines made at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital with NIH support have now been tested in humans. And the first publications come out. The first two publications indicate they're safe, immunogenic, but there's a problem. It takes a lot, a huge amount of antigen. So there's a lot more research to do. These vaccines are poorly immunogenic. Why it, it, the standard human vaccine, it takes 15 micrograms to give an excellent response. These take two doses of 90. There's not enough manufacturing capacity in the world to make enough of this vaccine if this virus gets away. So we have to establish the, mole the molecular basis of poor antigenicity. That's a fundamental question that can only be answered by institutions like NIH. So we need the support to do that kind of basic research. Poultry vaccines. I want to spend a minute or two with poultry vaccines and you're all going to say, what's he talking about poultry vaccines for when this is a human problem? I'll get to it. Poultry vaccines, there is a real problem with poultry vaccines. They are not standardized for antigen content. 
And if anyone has any clout with their agricultural friends, do tell them they're not meeting international standards like human vaccines, because we have the presence of the situation. The good vaccines provide protection despite some antigenic drift, uh, no disease at all in the poultry, and they reduce the level of virus so that the, the chickens don't shed virus and transmit it chicken to chicken. The bad vaccines protect against disease signs, but the chickens go on pooping out virus and infecting for a long time. And I think that is the problem in the ducks in southern China. On the other hand, there are good vaccines. We've used this reverse genetics to make vaccines and tested them in Kaki Campbell ducks. Again, at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And people are going to say, vaccines in ducks at Jude? Come on. I go on and tell you that these vaccines, the, probably the biggest study that's ongoing at the moment, is in Vietnam. In Vietnam, up until last November, there were daily new cases of H5N1, some 40-something deaths by November. They started to use vaccine, the best vaccine that China produces, and there have been no more human cases no more chicken or duck cases. And so with the use of a high quality agricultural vaccine, you can stop this virus and control it. So we've got to think not only about vaccines for humans, we have got to think about vaccines for ducks and poultry. And US Agriculture Department is right on top of this. They know that. Antivirals, um, the antivirals, uh, there, there are two antivirals that are effective. An old fashioned one, amantadine, the viruses from 97 in Hong Kong were sensitive. The viruses since then have been resistant, you get rapid resistance. The good news is that many of the viruses out of a uh, bit, uh, Indonesia are sensitive, so that drug is still useful. It should be stored. The good news is oseltamivir, the neuraminidase inhibitor, works very well in the mouse model. 10 milligrams per kilogram per day completely abolish the virus. Again, this drug would not have been developed without NIH. This is basic research that actually began on the barrier reef in Australia with the isolation of viruses from pelagic birds, <coughs> crystallization of the structure and design of the drug. So it takes basic research to get to this point. So I'm about to finish up and want to fill you in on the current situation. And the, the current situation in humans in the world. The big problem at the moment is Indonesia. There's been a family cluster with seven infected humans and the possibility of human to human, not once, twice, or but three times, the possibility. And so that's extremely worrying. The nurses looking after those, that, those families also got infected. And the worry was, oh my God, it's actually moving outside the families. It so happens that the nurses and some of my colleagues, in fact, are infect were infected with standard flu. While this is good news, the bad news is that both of these things, both of these viruses, standard flu and bird flu, are there in those villages together. And so, I say don't become complacent because God knows what's going to happen as a result of that. There are three families of these viruses generated, so we have to make more vaccines to cope with that. In poultry, the, uh, this asymptomatic infection in many of the ducks kills the swans. Our worry is that the virus is going to become 
the killer is going to become established in the wild birds of the world. My second last slide is the general advice to you and to reassure you somewhat. At this time, it's extremely difficult for humans to be infected. Those clusters presumably have unique genetic features in those families. Another point to be made is that The poultry industry in infected countries is extremely badly hit, and unjustifiably so, because cooked frozen poultry is not a problem. If this virus does move human to human, the healthcare industry in the world would run way beyond capacity. There is no way on God's earth that any hospital can hope to cope with the situation. The care is going to, people are going to say, government should take care of us. The reality is that we'll have to be taken care of at the family level. Government, of course, can add a great deal with fundamental research and put into place many of the things, but they cannot take care of this at the family level. Another prob possibility, probability, is that if this virus gets away that the, and causes a cytokine storm, it will be the pregnant women and young adults that will be the hardest hit. So I leave you with a question that none of us can answer, is will this virus learn to become transmitted human to human? We have no way of telling. We have the capacity to make these viruses but we takes time to do these experiments under very controlled conditions. So don't, com be, don't become complacent because this virus has the ability to accumulate mutations, mutations or reassortants and to learn to go human to human. In the Asian calendar, we've survived the year of the chicken. We're now in the year of the dog. Is it gonna bite us? And I just would like to finish by acknowledging that all of this work was supported by NIAID, NIH, and the infrastructure from St. Jude in Memphis, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital provider the facilities for doing these studies under high containment and generating vaccines. And many young people in Memphis, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, and in different parts of the world provided the virus that allow it to do the studies. Thank you for your attention. Well, you certainly scared the heck out of us, Doctor. But let me ask you this, Dr. Webster. My uncle Peter, in 1918, was drafted, went to a camp at Camp Devons. Everybody around him, all the young men, were dying of the Spanish flu. He drank a quart of Canadian club every day and he survived. <laughs> but my question really is, seriously, if that, that flu was transmitted from person to person, and if that flu is like what you're talking about today, why isn't it likely that this would be transmitted person to person? <clears throat> well, it's still possible. That's my message, that it's still possible, even though the H5N1 has been around for 10 years, don't com become complacent because it is very possible that it will become human to human. Back in 1918, the virus, we don't know where that came from. It, it may have come out of um, Kansas, but it may have come from wild birds from Asia to Kansas. And, and so it, and it took some time to generate probably. The, uh, your relative may have been infected with the early mild strain. It, there was early in the 1918, in March and April, there was a mild strain. He may have got infected with that, and so he'd be naturally immune. And so, yeah. Now, now was that virus also H5N1? Do we know that? No, the virus from 1918 was H1N1. We know exactly, this virus has been totally sequenced by Jeffrey Taubenberger 
again with support from NIH, so that we understand and how to design drugs and vaccines and to understand pathogenesis. We had to remake 1918 under safe conditions. People worried about that and should it have been done? I say yes, it had to be done under appropriate conditions of containment because this H5N1 is potentially a lot, lot worse. Final question before we turn to the audience. Uh, are all those nations, China, Indochina, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, do they have transparency? Do they really cooperate with us in telling us what happens in their countries? A very good question. <laughs> <laughs> they do to some extent. And, and this, this is the big struggle for the international agencies to keep nudging them to become more and more and more transparent. Some of them do and do magnificently. Others, the, the, it's a constant battle to get all of the information. The difficulty is trade. Trade, as soon as you say that you have H5 in your poultry, there's a ban put in on by OIE. And this is a real problem. And so the countries, the trading, if, if you're a poultry farmer in Thailand, for example, you didn't want OIE to put a ban on chicken trade. In fact, it eventually came out that Thailand had H5N1. Their 100 billion baht poultry industry collapsed to nothing. And, and so there is a tendency to hide those things. How do you inoculate a chicken? You inoculate a chicken with a needle just like you. <laughs> but at the back of the neck, pick it up by... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. Um, Will you wait a moment for the microphone, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Webster. Uh, Lyndon Huber with the Department of Health and Human Services. Two questions. First, um, over the last six months, there's been a lot of discussion in congressional uh, briefings and, and caucuses that the Tamiflu uh, vaccine is a vaccine that should be stockpiled. In your opinion, is that a good vaccine for this potential virus? And second, um, this last week, um, Secretary Levitt announced that we would need roughly six months upon the mutation of, of the virus to begin the production of a, of a vaccine, if, depending on the strand. Um, is that too long, and what would you suggest we should do? The question, the, the Tamiflu isn't a vaccine, it's an antiviral. It's a drug to treat. So the first line of defense if, if this virus appears in the community, it takes six months to make a new vaccine. That's why we make, vac my advice is to make vaccines against one of these current ones. It's not going to be a perfect match to cover and use in the essential health industry people for six months while a new one is being made in conjunction with Tamiflu. Uh, that is when the drug is most useful. And this drug is the best we've got. I mean, there isn't anything else. If we use this drug prophylactically, it's very, very effectively effective. It's not very good for treating people after the event. And the, this drug has been used in Southeast Asia two, three, four days after they get infected, and it really isn't effective then because the virus has got into the brain everywhere and all you get is resistance. <coughs> Early on, it's effective. WHO have got <coughs> two huge, well, relatively huge stashes of Tamiflu. <coughs> uh, they tell me <coughs> three semi-trailer fulls of, of, of uh, Tamiflu, about one 747 load to use as a fire blanket when and if this thing moves. And they were looking at activating it in Indonesia, but they called that off. So those are the points. Yes, sir. Uh, just a moment, please. Just the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Alan Glass, Senator Biden. 
We know that the, uh, the 1918 virus was extraordinarily transmissible from person to person, yet the case fatality rate was only like 2%, very low. The H5N1 is very poorly transmissible from person to person, but the case fatality rate is over 50%. My question is, is there some kind of inverse link between the genes that have to do with lethality and transmissibility such that we would maybe expect something like the Andromeda strain uh, scenario, where as it becomes more transmissible, it becomes less lethal, or can we not rely on that? The answer is we don't have the knowledge to answer your question. We need, in every way, we need about five more years of fundamental research to answer those questions. We have the strategy of making any influenza virus, putting these genes together, and answering those important questions. And so to do that, we've got to have containment, high containment facilities. There's only a few of those available in the world. And, and so we've got to have those, we've got to have basic <coughs> research to answer each one of those questions that you raised, because we don't have the knowledge at this time to very important questions, we don't have the answers. I wish we did. Yes, sir. Just a moment for the microphone, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Matthew Berger with Congressional Quarterly. I want to, first a clarification, when you talk about um, people going out and getting uh, a vaccine this year, are you talking about a vaccine or are you talking about the antiviral? And uh, the other question is, a lot of the discussion has been about short dosing, giving people half a dose or less in order to allow, uh, get more people vaccinated when this occurs. How important would that work, essentially, is my question, or will people really need the full dosage? The first and important point is that the, the information, the new information I gave you, is the current vaccine that will be available come September this year. The current human vaccine, not an H5 vaccine, the current human vaccine. Get that. It's available to everyone. So, and it does protect 50% of, of the mice. But remember that, you're not a mouse. We hope it'll work. <laughs> and we believe that it will. The second point, the, the, the dose sparing effects, the difficulty at the moment is that it's taking too much vaccine and, and we, have to decide will half of that work and so on. Again, it comes down to research to determine how little vaccine, how little vaccine can we give to people and still get protection. The difficulty is the current method of assessing whether you're protected is by measuring HI antibodies. The HI antibodies don't necessarily correlate with protection. So some of these are going to have to wait until the virus does appear, or studies in ferret models. Doctor, are you suggesting, or are you stating, that in case this pandemic struck, we would have to quarantine large portions of our population? That is not my area of expertise, but I would suggest it is going to happen. Yes, please. Hi, Bobby Perry with Applied Biosystems. We make instruments and reagents to detect for your surveillance. I'm wondering if you could speak to how the world is communicating. I know that a lot of federal money in the United States is filtering down to organizations and institutions uh, along the Western fly zone here. So if you could speak to how that information is being communicated to the world, because to be able to do containment mitigation, um, it has to be done early. So we have to have clear and quick communication of that information. Can you speak to that? You're referring to the introduction of H5N1 into the Americas? No, I'm, I'm just simply talking about we're doing surveillance all over the world. Um, we currently are working on surveillance here in the United States, looking at the Western fly zone. But how is the world doing their communication? Because the most important thing, I think, we've all in, in our readings have found that the sooner we find it, the, the sooner we address it, the better off we'll be. We won't have to do as, as many mitigation steps as... Uh, the uh, surveillance, there's a great deal of surveillance now going on. 
The, the surveillance, the, the basic research that I've talked about over the past 30 years, uh, I have to tell you that uh, until five years ago, people gave a big yawn when I talked about influenza in wild birds and said that's a problem for agriculture. Agriculture said no, it's a problem for the wild bird people. Who gives a damn? Now there's a huge amount of surveillance going on. In fact, in Europe it's now recognized, FAO put out there that the wild bird is the early warning system for the presence of H5N1 in your country and for preparing for humans. And this information is coming out rapidly in Europe. The uh, coming out of FAO and out of the labs, the information has got to come out fast. Uh, there is still reluctance on the part of countries uh, to give the information and still some inf reluctance to give the viruses. We were running into intellectual property questions in terms of who owns the virus. Uh, and it's understandable because countries like Indonesia are somewhat reluctant to give the viruses away because we make high growth vaccine strains, the manufacturers in USA make money, what do the Indonesians get? Diddly. And, and so there is qu big questions to be answered. We all make a lot of fuss about, they are not telling us everything. What do we give them back? Not a hell of a lot. And so there are some questions that we have to answer to the rest of the world. And I, I suspect that we are going to have to start giving back something to these countries that provide the vaccine strength. Uh, doctor, uh, I think you said it's a respiratory disease, so if, 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 if it passes on to humans, and mutates, question, will we pass on by coughing on each other? How, how do we pass it to each other? A very important question, actually. The, uh, it, the, the virus in the wild bird, we used to think that it was mainly fecal. The, the virus replicated the intestine of the bird. They pooped it into the water and they drank the water, fecal oral. We now know that the virus is mainly in the respiratory tract and it gets into the water from the respiratory tract. From humans, and my colleagues in Vietnam uh, show that the virus is highest in the respiratory secretions but the virus is actually low down in the lungs, and that's one of the reasons that it's not transmitted well. The, the receptors are down in the lungs, not in the upper respiratory tract, so it's not shed well. The worrying thing is feces from these people have virus in them, and this is something we've not had before. But like SARS, SARS in Hong Kong was spread on the doorknobs, with people who didn't wash their hands after they had diarrhea. And so these are things that we worry about, we don't know will or will not occur if it goes. And let me add that we have no idea whether this virus will or will not go, transmit human to human. There's no way to tell. But like all of these catastrophic events, like hurricanes, earthquakes, you'd better be prepared for it, because it could. Yes, sir. Uh, just a moment, please. Uh, Henry Hirsch, uh, University of Kentucky College of Medicine, retired. Uh, two points. One, on this business of half doses. Uh, this is more or less anecdotal, but I know that during World War II, the Navy had a uh, flu vaccine uh, uh, shortage problem, and they found that uh, uh, by giving the vaccine subcutaneously rather than in the usual shot, that they were able to stretch it twice as far. Now the other question is, I, you don't have to preach to me about taking flu vaccine. I've been taking it for 40 years, three times a year, every four months. So, okay, I'm, I'm a convert, but I'm running, <laughs> short, I'm running short of my fix. More and more as years have gone on, I've had a hard time even getting the first shot. The second one, very difficult. And by the time I need the third one, nobody has any. And I understand that this is because the manufacturers don't find flu vaccine to be a profitable product. And is there anything that we can do about this? Have you got about an hour or something? But to, to answer all of those questions, the studies have already been done on subcutaneous intradermal 
and it doesn't seem as though the H51 is any better by those routes. There is a shortage of vaccine capacity in the United States. United States relies on offshore manufacturing for half of its vaccine. Congress has recognized this and is putting that right. There have been several companies uh, now making vaccines in cells and, and, and there's an initiative to get the vaccine made on shore. It's got to be done or we're going to go back to the situation with the uh, swine flu. Swine flu uh, occurred, that incident in Fort Dix. Um, the Canadians, when the decision was to make vaccine, the Canadians said, uh, well, we need vaccine too. We get our vaccine from the United States. And the United States said, when we've made enough for the United States, you can have some. Canada is one of the few countries in the world that have the capacity to make more than vaccine than they use. I'm just waiting for the Canadians to say, can we have some too? Or the United States to have, to ask some of the Canadian, and they do, the Canadians are very good. But there is a shortage of capacity to make vaccine because it's not very productive, uh, not very profitable. It's not a Viagra. It doesn't produce much profit. And, and companies are entitled to some profit. And, and, and we, as a scientific industry, have pushed their profit levels down below what is reasonable. And that with intellectual property and claims against the manufacturers. All of these problems have to be sorted out at the very top level of government. And they are addressing them, which is good. There is a fundamental problem that you've identified with the capacity of US to make its own vaccine. And that, that's tragic. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Richard White with the Alpine Group on behalf of Medimian. One of the issues uh, that you touched upon are some of the reasons why we don't have a domestic capacity. Uh, how would you explain the stabilization of the supply of folks who will get the flu shot? CDC can makes a recommendation each year on who should get it. And that is somewhat limited, uh, the number of folks, because of a shortage. You know, you want to get it to the elderly and the uh, pediatric population. But isn't that one of the other areas where, you know, a manufacturer is not going to enter if the market is one year, 10 million, the next year, 15 million, rather than trying to expand the recommendation to, you know, everyone, a universal recommendation? The, the that, that that is a problem. and and, and uh, Canada, again, I'll go back to Canada, Ontario have made it a uh, vaccine. If you look at vaccine, it is economically sound to vaccinate the whole population. And, and, and Ontario has made a recommendation to vaccinate everyone on Ontario, and everyone's watching that experiment, I'm sure. Hopefully, a similar recommendation will be made for United States. But, you know, there is reluctance to, to uh, rely on government to provide everything. You know, we, we uh, really can't expect government to take care of every aspect. And, and so it's got to be driven by demand. And so we have to educate the public the benefits of getting vaccine and I, I suspect you're right that initially it's going to be necessary for governments to underwrite the vaccine if it's not used. I, I don't think you're going to have a shortage or, or an excess next year. When this message that I just talked about today gets out there, there may be a shortage of vaccine that the companies around the world are not going to be able to make enough. Uh, yes, miss. Oh, just a second for the microphone, please. Hi. What do you think is the most promising uh, future method of creating vaccines, like as opposed to using egg embryos, since it takes six months at least to make them through that method? Is there a faster method that you're working on? There are several other strategies. If, if we're going to use uh, cell culture based, that, that's one of the 
things that's in the pipeline. It, it's not going to be short of cell-based vaccines. The shortest possible vaccine, the, the two strategies would be DNA vaccination, and, and there's been approval for tests on that. DNA vaccine, where you synthesize the uh, DNA copy of the RNA and use that as a vaccine. Uh, that is quite effective. It hasn't been used in large numbers of humans, and there's lots of research to be done. DNA vaccination is the strategy of the future once we understand how to use it. But how, long would, is it how long does it currently take for you to do the DNA vaccine? To make a DNA vaccine would take a matter of two or three weeks. Uh, but, you know, there is not enough fundamental work done on DNA vaccines. We know they work. We don't know of the upside and downside of immunizing millions and millions of people. So this is where research is required. The other strategy is to use uh, baculovirus expressed or one of the expression systems. There are, again, not enough research has been done the current vaccines are made, as you know, in chicken embryos. F most further along is live attenuated vaccines are approved. And, and then there is uh, cell-based vaccines. Those are the current strategies. Last question. Go ahead, sir. Yes, I wonder, do you think we should be stockpiling N95 masks? I understand they are relatively inexpensive, 95 cents or so. Sorry, I didn't uh, catch. A, a mask. A mask. Oh, they, yeah. <laughs> That's my southern, my southern accent. <laughs> that question was asked by the, uh, the people in <clears throat> Europe recently. And they, they can't really answer it this time as to whether or not it's useful or not. I believe that it is basically useful. There's two kinds of masks, of course. There's the co cotton mask that keeps your hands away from your mu mouth, and that's probably a plus, but in the SARS analysis of the SARS data from Hong Kong, it really didn't do anything. The fitted NP96 masks, yes, they are effective, uh, but how long can you wear them before you change them? Uh, th those questions are not fully answered. There's a lot of studies ongoing, particularly in England at the moment, on the advantages of, of masks. Dr. Webster, what about your own native land of down under in New Zealand? Are they at risk? Every country in the world's at risk. Yes, they, they, they are at risk and they know they're at risk. And, and in fact, they had me down there recently speaking to them. And my advice to them was they have agricultural uh, vaccine manufacturing capacity. And I said, you, you should look into, in a worst case scenario, converting that over to making vaccine in an emergency situation. Well, you scared the heck out of your countrymen and us today. And thank you very much, sir. We want to thank the uh, Joint Steering Committee for Public Policy for sponsoring this luncheon. And I want to tell you that on June the 28th, uh, June the 28th, we will have a, a topic for our caucus, Finding Genes for Human Disease, the HapMap Project. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much.